All right, welcome back. Hope you're having a great week and weekend. Today we're continuing our BCBA exam practice question series. We're going through a set of practice questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out bcbastudy.com for our three practice exams, our task list study guide, and our famous combo pack. Next week, we will start our fourth practice exam. We wrapped up exam three explanations yesterday, so very excited about that. As always, questions or comments, let us know. Work hard, study hard. Let's get to our questions. Question one. Lacey runs her own maid service. Lacey's maids are the best in the business. They can clean stains, spills, dirt, dust, and anything else. Spills, dirt, and dust are a type of what? Last week, we released our stimulus and stimulus class video as part of our Let's Learn ABA series. We need to know the difference between response classes and stimulus classes and what composes response classes and stimulus classes. In this case, are we talking about responses or stimuli? Well, we have Lacey and her maid service. They clean spills, dirt, and dust. Spills, dirt, and dust are stimuli. Cleaning is a response. So if we look at spills, dirt, and dust, are they all evoking the same behavior? They are. They're evoking behavior of cleaning, right? So they are a type of stimulus class evoking the same behavior, serving the same function, getting rid of these spills, dirt, and dust. Now we have to ask ourselves, are they related in any formal way? Well, not really, right? Spills could be very wet. Dirt is gr gritty and grimy. And dust is just kind of airy. So nothing really formally connects any of these things. The only thing that connects them as a part of a stimulus class is how they evoke behavior. So what are they? Are they a response class? They're not. They're not responses. They're stimuli. Are they a formal stimulus class? Formal stimulus class refers to the form, right? What it looks like. And if we look at D, a feature stimulus class, well, formal and feature are essentially the same thing. We're looking at the features, the form, they're paired together based on their features or their characteristics. Spills, dirt, and dust aren't paired together because of their characteristics. They're all evoking the same behavior. So since they're not similar, but are still evoking the same behavior, what are they? What are they? Well, they're part of an arbitrary stimulus class. Three Arbitrary items, spills, dirt, and dust, all part of the same class of stimuli evoking this functional behavior. Spills, dirt, and dust are a type of arbitrary stimulus class. At the latest IEP meeting for your client, the teacher states she wants to improve the client's ability to read by themselves. The teacher needs help tracking the behavior, but also has 19 other students to worry about. What measurement might you suggest? Okay, we've done something similar to this question, but We've gotten a lot of questions about when to use what type of distance. So we wanted to go over it again just to hammer the point home. Remember, we're practicing here, right? First things first, what measurement might you suggest? Or picking measurements. The key here first is to identify that the teacher has 19 other students to worry about. All we know is about the 19 other students. So maybe her time is low, maybe her resources are low. If it's your job as a consultant, to give her advice, and she tells you, I have 20 students in my class, ideally, you might start looking at some sort of discontinuous measurement, right? It's going to give her more time to focus on this client, at least in the moment, right? So what can we eliminate? We can eliminate duration. Now, we ask ourselves, what is the behavior of interest? What are we measuring? Well, we're measuring the client's ability to read by themselves, and she wants to improve that ability. So we want to increase that ability. Now, if we want to increase something, and we're using a time sampling or interval measurement, what's going to be ideal? You have to think about how is it going to look when you're actually measuring the behavior. If I'm measuring the client reading to themselves using momentary time sampling, am I going to get a real good indication of how well they're actually reading by themselves? No, because if my interval is for a minute and I'm using momentary time sampling, I'm only looking at the client at the end of each minute. So it's going to be almost random on when I observe them reading by themselves. It's not going to give me a clear picture of how long they're doing it. Because maybe they, don't, they read for 58 seconds. And then when I look up for the two seconds, right, or the, the one second at the end of the interval, they're not reading anymore. My data is going to indicate they're not reading by themselves. When in reality, they were reading for almost 99% of the time. Right? 
the momentary time sampling, yes, is a strategy, but it's not going to be necessarily the best measurement to suggest at first to improve or increase its ability to read. Partial intervals kind of suffers from the same thing, right? Because if we have a one minute long interval and our client reads for a single second, well, we're just going to check off they've read. So if they're reading for one second each interval, our data is going to indicate they're reading by themselves quite a lot. In reality, they're only reading one or two seconds each time. So what we really want to do is look at whole interval. We have a one minute interval. We're going to be looking at the client for that entire interval and maybe only 10 minutes at a time, right? But still, a whole interval. So we're, we're trying to hit one minute, maybe too, that's too long. So we start at 20 seconds. But this way, we get a clear indication, are we reading for an actual extended period of time? Instead of just in the moment, as momentary time sampling would be, or briefly, as partial interval. So if we want to improve or increase the ability to read by themselves, and we want a discontinuous measurement, let's first suggest whole interval recording. A BCBA who works at a company called Level Up ABA is currently supervising eight RBTs. The company hires three more RBTs and wants the BCBA to supervise them as well. The BCBA does not think they can. What should the BCBA do? Ethics questions. Ethics on your exam, you need to be black and white. You need to pull straight from the ethical code. They're very, very literal. So in this case, the supervisory question, supervising RBTs, you have eight, or this BCBA has eight already. The company wants the BCBA to supervise three more. BCBA does not think they can. They think their case or their supervisory caseload is full. Supervisory caseload is full. What should they do? Straight from the ethical code. A, perform a self-assessment of their supervisory load. Yes, this is mentioned in the ethics code. They need to perform a self-assessment of their caseload. B, refuse to take on the supervisees. Yes, also from the ethical code, you should only supervise as many RBTs as you are capable of. If you don't think you can, and your self-assessment indicates that, you shouldn't take them on. And then C, report the results of the self-assessment to the company, also from the ethical code. You also need to report the results. So you can't just do the assessment and not give the results and just say, well, I don't want to take them. Form a self-assessment, report the results of the self-assessment to the company, and then refuse to take on the supervisees if they continue to persist. Point to the ethical code. Remember, we have to abide by the ethical code, which isn't always easy, but it is our guiding code that as BCBAs, we have promised to live up to. So self-assessment, report those results, and then continue to reviews, refuse to take on the supervisees if you're not capable of doing more than eight in this case, right? So what should the BCBA do? Well, is D, all the above. Again, this is straight from the ethical code. For a weekly supervision meeting, both the RBT and the parents attend. The RBT presents their data sheets from the past week to the BCBA. The parent informs the BCBA that they're happy with the progress the client was made, has made with Manding. The graph inside of the data collection system indicates the client has made no progress. What data source should the BCBA use to make a determination on how to proceed? Okay, not a hard question. I would say a three or four. But what makes the test challenging, if you've prepared the right way, is these type of questions where they're long, a lot of information, and you have to think for a second to really understand what they're asking and what they're answering. Okay, What tends to happen is people get a long question and they want to rush through it. You can't do that. The longer the question, the slower you need to go. Okay, that should be obvious, but it's not. The longer the question, the slower you go, the more work you do on the actual question itself. So in this case, we're asking about the data source the BCBA should use to make its determination on how to proceed. Well, in order to choose a data source, we need to identify what our data sources are. First data source, RBT presents data sheets from past week. Okay, so raw, ungraphed data. Second data source, parent informs BCBA they're happy with the progress client has made. So we have an anecdotal indirect report. Third data source, the graph inside of the data collection system saying the client has made no progress. Which data source is going to be best? What's going to be the most objective and the most empirical? Well, it's going to be the data collection system inside and the graph inside the data collection system. Whatever the data, whatever the graph says is 
is what the graph is, right? That's the data. Why is the graph better than the data sheets? Because the graph we can visually analyze with a high degree of fidelity. If we're just looking through raw data and trying to analyze it, there's a chance we might make a mistake. So ideally, you'd use the graph and then data sheets. Lastly, you would use parent report. And why? Well, parents are biased, typically indirect servers, right? They don't see the data. They don't collect the data. They just go by with what they feel okay, and what they think they see. Our data is indicating a client's not making any progress. So even though the parent thinks they're making progress, okay, we need to use the actual data in the graph to make a determination of how to proceed. And we should not use our own best judgment, empirical, objective data. We consider our own best judgment might not actually be best judgment. So what data source should the BCBA use to make a determination on how to proceed? B, the graphed data. Lynn is conducting a functional analysis of the client. The client is given a stack of worksheets and told to complete all the worksheets before they are allowed to leave. After the client completes two problems, the client says, this is stupid, you're stupid. You tell the client they can play with toys for 10 minutes. After playing, they go back to work and the same scenario happens. Condition of the FA are you in? Functional analyses, we have different conditions, right? And you can kind of see the risk of FAs because if we're allowing the client get away with this is stupid you're stupid we could be potentially reinforcing the behavior so we need to be very ethical and very smart when doing fas now what the question is asking though what is the question asking the question is asking about the condition that we're in and fa conditions are not difficult they're very obvious okay our control condition is essentially play free play okay whatever the client wants they get alone is exactly what it sounds like completely alone looking typically for self stems Contingent escape, we are allowing escape when escape might normally not be allowed. So in this case, if the client is told to do the worksheets and they say, this is stupid, you're stupid, typically we're not going to allow them to escape. But in this case, we did. So contingent attention, we're not giving them attention. We're just allowing them to escape from the task, right? So you have to really understand, are you escaping? Are you allowing escape or are you giving attention? Here, we're allowing escape. So after playing, they go back to work, same scenario happens. Essentially, you give task, demand, client, protest, you allow escape. So what condition of the FA are you in? Well, contingent escape. Which of the following answer choices is an example of not maintaining client dignity? Pretty easy question. I'd say a three or four on the difficulty scale. We understand what client dignity is, right? We respect the client, we show empathy to the client, and we award them the same rights any other non-client might have. Which makes this question difficult is reading carefully and identifying this word not. So three of these will be examples of maintaining client dignity. And reading carefully, once we understand the question, follows through to the answer choices, right? Because if you look at A, Allowing the client to eat lunch, even if they engaged in maladaptive behaviors in the morning. If we read this too quickly, we might think, well, we have to allow them to eat lunch. But that's what it's saying. It's saying you're allowing the client to eat lunch, even if they engaged in maladaptive behaviors in the morning. So A, are you maintaining client dignity? You are. And we're looking for the example of not maintaining client dignity. So A can't be our answer. B, preventing the client from using the restroom for several minutes until they complete their task. Can we withhold the restroom for several minutes for an extended period of time? We cannot. Everybody has a right to the restroom. We should not be denying access to the restroom for several minutes. B looks like an example of not maintaining client dignity. Do we pick B and move on? No, we read all of our answer choices to make sure we have the best answer. So C, avoiding using client's name or information when talking about clients in public. What have you done here? You've maintained privacy. C is a fantastic way of maintaining dignity. And then D, including the client when you're making their daily schedule. Should we involve clients in the decision-making process? Absolutely. To the fullest extent possible, engage clients, involve them. After all, they're the ones who have to go through the treatment, so they might as well be engaged. A looks like we're maintaining client dignity. So does C and so does D. That leaves us with B. We should not prevent the client from using the restroom for several minutes just so they can complete a task. That is undignified. 
you would not want somebody to prevent you from using the restroom. So, yes. Which of the following is an example of punishment? The last question, we had a not question. No not in this one, so pretty easy. We're just looking for an example of punishment. What is punishment? Punishment is decreasing a behavior by adding or removing something. Always define the terms, especially when practicing. Fluency, fluency, fluency. The more fluent you are, the better you'll do. A, James engages in self-stimulatory behavior. You put James in timeout, and he continues to engage in self-stimulatory behavior. Well, we're looking at a consequence. And we're looking at punishment. If we're looking at punishment, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is, did the behavior decrease? The most important part of punishment. Well, did it? Well, you put James in timeout, and he continued to engage in self-stimulatory behavior. Behavior didn't decrease. It's not punishment. B, John loves to dial random phone numbers from his phone. You disconnect his phone service so that he, the calls he makes do not connect. Are we punishing John here? Well, think about it. He can still dial all these phone numbers, but nothing happens. So this previously reinforced behavior no longer gets reinforcement. We're putting the behavior on extinction. Gotta be careful. That's what trips people up. Extinction and punishment are not the same thing. Punishment, we are adding or removing something in response, right? Extinction, we're just withholding reinforcement. Okay? So we're withholding reinforcement for John's dialing the phone numbers. This is extinction. C, Jane is praised in science class for raising her hand, but ignored in math class when she raises her hand. So if Jane is reinforced in one instance and, it, and her behavior is put on extinction in another, that sounds like differential reinforcement, not punishment. Leads us with D, Jimmy loves his teddy bear. Whenever Jimmy starts to whistle, his dad takes away the teddy bear, stops whistling. Behavior decrease. It did. Did we remove something or get, add something in response? We did. What happened? Well, Jimmy starts to whistle. Dad takes away the teddy bear. Jimmy stops whistling, right? The consequence is removal, so negative punishment. Jimmy stops whistling. This is a great example of punishment. Which of the following is the least appropriate reason to discontinue services? Again, straight from the ethical code, you have to know these different reasons to discontinue services. A, the client stopped benefiting from services two months, months ago. Is the client not benefiting from services a reason to discontinue services? It is. It is very appropriate. If they're not benefiting, there's no reason for us to go there and continue serving them. B, the client's college-age brother who lives in a dorm is not complying with treatment. So, on the ethical code, it says, do relevant stakeholders comply with treatment and behavior plans? Is a college-age brother who lives in a dorm really a relevant stakeholder? Mm, maybe not, right? It doesn't seem like it's that big a deal that the college-age brother who lives in a dorm is not that involved with treatment. B is definitely less appropriate than A. C, the insurance company put funding on hold for the next six months. Is funding a reason to discontinue services? It is, straight from the task list, uh, the ethical code. You're not obligated to provide services for free. D, the client wishes to stop services because they need a personal break. Can the client discontinue services at any time? Yes, they can. We have to honor their wishes. Which one is the least appropriate reason to discontinue services? What's going to be B? A non-relevant stakeholder, such as a college-age brother who lives in a dorm, does not necessarily need to comply with the treatment. That should not affect your treatment to the level of not being effective. If it, if it does, there might be some other things going on. B is the least appropriate reason to discontinue services. Finally, an impure attack is composed of A. Somebody asked this question the other day. I thought it was a wonderful question. We don't talk about impure attacks too much. We, we really talk about pure verbal operants. Well, let's just quickly talk about impure tax. So what's a tax? Tax is a label both by a nonverbal SD. If we have an impure tax, we have to add a second verbal operant. And the question becomes, what verbal operant is that? It's not B, because interverbal and man are part of a tax. Is it going to be a tax and an interverbal or a man in the tax? Well, a tax and interverbal kind of contradict each other. Because an interverbal is a verbal SD, a tax is nonverbal. What we're looking for is C, a man and a tact. There's an MO at play and also a nonverbal SD. So if you want a beer, the MO's at play, and then you see a beer and you say beer, that's an impure tact. 
demand plus the nonverbal SD evokes this behavior. So an impure attack is composed of a demand attack. Just another piece of information to add into your toolbox. The more, the better, right? The more aware and knowledgeable you are, your test becomes. Fantastic. Love it. Please, please, please like and subscribe. Questions, comments, let us know. Check out bcbastudy.com for study materials. As always, work hard, study hard. I'll see you soon.